with a short story, and then we kind of go through uh, the economy, yeah, the economy situation right now. Then we uh, delve into autonomous machine computing, why this is the next big thing, and you guys should work on this to guarantee the success for the next two decades or so. Uh, so let's get started uh, instead of wasting any time. Um, so I tell you a very short story of myself um, in around uh, when 2008, uh, the financial crisis hit, I was in a Professor Gordius lab. And when it gets to 2009, uh, the situation was very bad. Uh, no one gets no jobs out there. Uh, everybody's laying off. Um, so much worse than compared to today. And then luckily through the training of uh, Professor Gordius lab, I, I landed a job at Microsoft working on mobile computing. Um, and at the time, mobile computing was the biggest thing. Uh, and Microsoft was just launching its effort on a, a Windows phone, although it was not a success at the end. But at the time, uh, uh, Microsoft committed a huge amount of uh, resources into that area to make sure that Microsoft has a share in the market. And that trend lasted about five, six years. Uh, and then later on, you see other apps popping up, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, WhatsApp later on. Uh, so you see the whole era of mobile computing, even in the economic downturn. So my fear is that even in an economic downturn, it's the best opportunity to work on something new. Uh, so that if you're going to launch a startup, you have a uh, open window uh, for creating miracles. Uh, then if you're not looking for launching a startup, uh, then the big firms, uh, the tech firms are going to invest heavily in these new areas. So you guarantee your success for the next decade or so. So that's the, the gist of today's talk. So let's look at uh, what I call the virtuous circle, uh, the role of computer architecture in that. Uh, so if we examine the history, uh, by the way, for details, you can look at this uh, Forbes article that has all the details. Uh, but if we examined uh, the history of uh, computing, uh, we see different trends. Um, personal computing, we, when you talk about x86 windows kind of architecture, uh, then we have mobile computing. Uh, we talk about Android uh, plus uh, ARM architecture. There's a very interesting observation that, that I made. Is that however big uh, the sector for computer architecture or semiconductor in that era, for example, uh, personal computing, once the whole era gets mature, it would enable an ecosystem that's about 25 uh, to 15 times bigger than the semiconductor sector. Uh, sector. And then as the ecosystem grows, they pour more resources into growing the semiconductor or computer architecture sector. Then as the computer architectures uh, becomes better, enabling more ecosystem, then the ecosystem grow as well. So it's like a snowball effect that rolls bigger and bigger. Uh, but the uh, observation is that it's always 15 to 25 times bigger uh, that the computer architecture and semiconductor industry enables. Uh, that's true in personal computing. If we look at today's market, uh, the PC chip market in terms of billion dollars uh, market share is uh, $55 billion uh, last year. And then when we examine uh, the ecosystem, it's about $900 billion ecosystem. If we examine mobile computing, it's similar trend. You see 35.1 uh, for the mobile uh, chip market. Uh, then we examine the whole application ecosystem uh, on App Store or on Android Store. It's about $800 uh, billion. Dollars. So 23, 25 times bigger. So that's uh, what we can learn from history. Then uh, the second trend we see today, economic trend, is that uh, we are entering into a race of automation uh, represented by intelligent electric vehicles. Uh, for example, in 2021, IEV or intelligent electric vehicle sales, it's about 9% of all passenger cars. And mainly there are only um, two major OEMs. Uh, one, one, uh, one batch is from the United States, Ford, GM, Tesla, and so on. The other batch is from China. So you, you see these two countries are competing fiercely um, into this market, the IEV market. The European uh, car makers are, are lagging behind today. They are trying to invest a lot of money uh, into new technology to, to make up uh, the gap. But today, when we look examine the market, Tesla is obviously leading. Uh, and then we see a, a few Chinese EV makers uh, gaining markets while we're seeing this uphill battle. Uh, so those are where opportunity would appear if you work on autonomous machine computing or autonomous driving uh, related projects. They, they invest heavily in those areas. 
then when we go back to the money game, if you look at the monetization trend um, for uh, IEV, um, again, it's another Forbes article. Uh, if, if you're interested in the details, you can check. So global car sales uh, today, it's about $2.86 trillion. Then we look at used car sales, another $1.5 trillion. Then if you examine item by item, uh, you add everything up, it's about $5, $6 trillion market that we are looking at. It's pretty much the biggest sector that you can work on today. And one trend in this sector is intelligence and electrification. These are the two keywords that you should remember if you want to choose to work on the IEV sector. Electrification is pretty much done. Uh, Tesla has started electrification movement about a decade ago when they pushed the first product. Uh, and then after that, their battery management system becomes better and better. It's the intelligence that people are working on today, whether it's a, a smart cockpit that has different kind of features or uh, um, autonomous driving uh, that has different kind of applications. Uh, those are the areas that we should work on today. Then why IEV to start with? Because I think uh, car business strongly relies on the supply chain. Uh, whatever supply chain developed for cars can later on be trickled down for other markets for example, home service robot, industrial robots, they all rely on uh, this supply chain uh, to move forward uh, with. Um, so the market potential for the whole robotic sector or autonomous machine computing sector, it's much, much bigger than the car business itself. And the growth rate, if we examine the past 10 years of growth rate, it's tremendous, 22% per year growth rate. Um, the problem today is um, when you examine different kinds of robots, uh, it's very hard to find a common uh, computing stack that can enable all robots. I, I, it's all fragmented in a way that a drone would demand a kind of computing stack. A drone company then has to rebuild everything from scratch to enable that stack, as opposed to a cleaning robot company. Now, it's a totally different stack. So the whole market is fragmented. Uh, the solution, we think, to solve this problem is that if we could enable a unifying computer architecture, as well as its computing system uh, that captures all the common traits of all these different kinds of robots, then we can consolidate the market and make the whole market more efficient. And that's been our research goal. And that's our belief that will happen in the future. Uh, because if we go back to history again, if you are in the PC era, a PC would have many different types of application, word processing, Excel, PowerPoint, and so on and so forth. Uh, watching movie entertainment, playing games, but they have the same computer architecture x86, and they have the same operating system, pretty much Windows. Uh, in mobile, it's pretty much the same story. Uh, you have the ARM architecture, you have the Android or iOS uh, operating system, but enabling a wide spectrum of applications. But we are not seeing that in robotics today. And that's why we want to work on autonomous machine computing to consolidate everything. Another interesting point, what happens if you can uh, uh, do autonomous machine computing efficiently and uh, how do you define efficiency in this case? Uh, if you go back 20 years, uh, go back to the phone market, uh, 20 years back, phone market is already a very big market. You have players like Nokia, Ericsson, Sony in the game. Uh, but the whole size, if you examine back then, 20 years back, uh, it's a $10 billion market. It's a huge market, but not as huge compared to today. And if you examine the feature phone back then, uh, you can uh, dial a number and call someone, and you can receive uh, messages. That's pretty much it. You can listen to some music. That's the basic function. That's why we call it the feature phone. 90% uh, of the compute power uh, back then are dedicated to these basic functions, decoding, encoding, uh, basic computing. Uh, only 10% of computing power are available for applications. But if you examine an iPhone today, uh, it's a totally complete different story. First of all, the market size is not 10B, it's 800B. Uh, so they have grown by 80 times in 20 years. And if you examine your cell phone today, 90% of the compute power goes to end user applications, such as YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Only 10% would dedicate to uh, the basic communication functions, encoding, decoding, uh, messaging and so on. So that's how we enable an ecosystem. You, you free up more computing power for the interesting applications instead of dedicate uh, those kind of computing powers for the basic functions. 
And that's exactly what we see today in robotic computing. If you examine any chips that enable a robot, uh, for example, the diagram on the left, you, what we see is that perception pretty much takes up 50% of your computing power. Localization takes up 20% of your computing power. Planning control, and 20%. Then what you are left with for application, it's less than 10%. And that's why we do not have a autonomous machine computing ecosystem today because there's no ecosystem. There's no computing power for ecosystem. All the power are there to enable the basic function. Then what we are here to propose, the design should be you can spend less than 20% of the compute power on these uh, basic functions to enable robot sensing, perception, uh, planning, control, but leave about 80% of compute power for the interesting stuff, the applications. Then you will have a ecosystem, you can create an ecosystem. Then the developers will jump in and develop very interesting applications on top of it. Uh, then we will see the sectors grow and grow and grow. And that's the storyline. Okay, now, enough with the economy stuff. Uh, so now let's delve into the computing stuff, the hardcore stuff. What happens today? Uh, if we look at a autonomous machine, on the left side, you see a level four autonomous vehicle. On the right side, you see a vacuum, a robot vacuum, very basic form. Uh, but the computing pattern, it's very similar. On the left side, you see a bunch of sensor feeding a large amount of data into the pipeline. Then you do perception. Once you're done with perception, you do tracking, prediction. And the data, if you look at the data flow, the amount of data becomes smaller and smaller. At the end, you output control signals. So those are the common patterns of computing. It's pretty much a data flow graph that we are looking at. So if our compute machine can capture the data graph, uh, the data flow graph, uh, and then perform efficient computing on top of it, then we might be able to design a common architecture to enable different kinds of robots. So what are the architecture options uh, there for autonomous machines? In the past five, six years, we've been exploring this topic. It's good to uh, chain up different kind of accelerators uh, using data, uh, data flow architecture. Uh, but then for most of the perception and reasoning workflow, um, uh, end to end is the way to go. So my personal take it's a mix of all three. So first work uh, I would like to discuss is the data flow architecture. Uh, it just falls back to uh, Dr. Godio's uh, original research domain. Um, uh, this figure uh, appears from a, a paper that we published in Micro 2020. Uh, but pretty much what it says uh, from 3,000 feet is that uh, in order to emulate a data flow architecture, we have to use CPU, GPU, FPGA sensors and chain everything together to develop one machine uh, that can emulate the whole data flow graph. And this should not be the way to go because uh, imagine you are a company, a startup in this space, then how much effort you have to spend on building uh, such a computing system. For us, we spend about 50% of our budget just to develop the system, but we should spend the budget on something more uh, um, uh, commercially viable. Um, for example, develop new applications instead of spending on a computing system, but we had no choice because there was no uh, good available computer architecture uh, back then. Uh, uh, but hopefully uh, by sharing our learning, we can develop uh, data flow machines for um, different kind of uh, robotic workloads. We do put up uh, some of the uh, reference here in case you're interested to dig deeper uh, that we delve into this topic of um, uh, data flow architecture for robots. Uh, but if um, we, we uh, do a deep dive some more, uh, what we can see is that FPGA is really good at sensor processing because every FG, FPGA board uh, comes with a large amount of I.O interface and you can configure the hardware uh, to decide how you want to process the sensor data. Uh, then once you uh, process the sensor data, you scale down the, the amount of data, then you can send it to a GPU, uh, for example, for perception workloads. Uh, then you can send it to a CPU for planning control. And, and that's how we kind of emulate the whole data flow architecture uh, using uh, heterogeneous hardware. The second one is Fetograph. Fetograph, uh, I'm not going to do a deep dive here because it's a big topic. It uh, involves a lot of background knowledge, but pretty much it's an optimization algorithm. Uh, you can use Fetograph to predict the stock market uh, because it's pretty much, uh, it learns from the history and try to predict the future uh, and using optimization techniques. 
uh, that's a fact graph. The factors uh, are the previous data points uh, from the robot. And then you try to infer the next data point and that's the high level overview. Uh, but then we have implemented uh, a factor graph accelerated for different workloads, mainly in planning, in control, in, in SLAM or in localization algorithms. And when you chained up this data flow, uh, I mean, when you chained up this factor graph together, they can become a full graph that emulates the data flow graph uh, that we mentioned at the beginning. And that's the beauty um, of factor graph architecture. Uh, it's just one abstraction, but uh, they can do multiple workloads. The third one, which is a more recent work, it's end-to-end -end computing. Uh, what we have observed in the field, uh, uh, an interesting observation is that uh, the current technique of developing uh, autonomous machine computing is not scalable at all. It's not scalable. By scalable, I mean Google. If you think of Google, uh, when they had a, a hundred engineer team to build the engine to serve the world, the search engine, uh, the engine can serve a lot more customers and scales very well. It's only constrained by the available data and the available compute power instead of constrained by the available engineers. But in robotic, it's a different story. We are constrained by the available number of engineers instead of uh, available data and available uh, compute power. So that's what I meant by uh, scalability. How do we solve that? Uh, what are we using engineers for? Engineers uh, are used for collecting data, analyzing data, feed the data in the pipeline and fine tuning. Um, very manual process. And that's why we see a very fragmented uh, uh, autonomous machine computing ecosystem today. But what if uh, we can do a simulator that can generate many different types of data uh, to feed to the pipeline and let the data uh, train the pipeline? And the pipeline is going to be able to learn from data by itself. It's a self-sustaining pipeline. Uh, that's already happening. That's not our imagination or our visions. That's already happening. If you look at Tesla's pipeline today, it's exactly like that. If you look at Waymo's pipeline today, it's evolving from a module design that we mentioned at the beginning uh, to a uh, deep learning based design as depicted in this picture here. Uh, so in the future, um, um, based on the current development trajectory, what we envision is that there would be two transformers. One is the perception transformer that takes in different kinds of sensor data uh, that you can combine to generate what we call a BEV representation uh, of your environment so that the robot now can understand your environment, whether it's uh, in home service robot to understand the home environment or whether it's a um, autonomous vehicle that understands the, the road condition. Then based on this common understanding, what we call the BEV representation, the action transformer, another transformer architecture would then uh, act accordingly uh, to infer what are the next steps, then the control loop would, would carry on with that. Uh, but then a common roadblock in this pipeline, a uh, two transformer architecture pipeline is that uh, there wasn't enough data to train the pipeline. Well, if you try to collect data from the real environment, of course, there would not be enough data uh, to train pipeline. But if you can do very realistic simulation, uh, then to generate synthetic data, then you can have unlimited amount of data to, uh, to close the loop. Uh, that's exactly what we did to close the loop here. Uh, you would have a digital twin or simulation system. Um, to act as a design automation tool uh, to fit into the pipeline uh, so that the pipeline can train itself. And more and more companies are adopting this kind of approach. Uh, then it's very scalable. The engineer only has to maintain the pipeline instead of gathering data, analyzing data, clean up data, uh, so that the whole system becomes scalable. And that's the latest design. And then to carry on this design, when you think of hardware acceleration, if you are designing the x86 architecture for robots, uh, then you think about how to accelerate uh, the two items at the bottom, the perception transformer, as well as the, the vision transformer. And that's the trend we've been observing uh, thus far. And again, uh, one interesting uh, thing to work on at this point is, of course, design automation. How do you make it realistic, uh, as realistic as possible? Uh, if you uh, uh, keep yourself posted uh, with the latest news, you see uh, the RT2 work from uh, uh, Google pretty much they are adopting this approach. They collect all the available data uh, from the web to train their robot. Uh, and then they generate sy synthetic data uh, from their own simulation engine to train the robot so that the robot can perform multiple tasks. It's the same idea here. Uh, uh, but the fine detail is that if we are doing autonomous driving, uh, 
you need to generate a map of the environment, what we call a digital twin map. Then you'll need to have a sensor model to emulate sensor. You need to have a behavioral simulation to simulate the traffic participants. And, and you have to combine all those to form a final design automation tool. And I think in this domain, we are still at the very dawn of the development, still decades to go. Uh, I can ensure you um, companies like Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, uh, even Qualcomm, uh, who recently uh, announced their uh, uh, autonomous driving chip, will invest heavily in design automation to make sure that their chip has a, a huge market share uh, in the game. Another piece of work that uh, we collaborate with Professor Goldio's group, it's uh, how do you program them? Uh, today, to program autonomous machine is extremely complex. You have to learn multiple layers of knowledge. For example, how do you, uh, you, you need to understand the underlying hardware, whether it's the GPU, DSP, or FPGA. Then you need to understand uh, the middleware or the OS on top of it, uh, usually Linux. So that's fine. But on top of it, you have to understand the ROS environment. And most people use ROS or, or similar a platform similar to ROS. You have to understand details of ROS, how to operate that. Then on top of that, you program your seller, uh, you, you pro, uh, program your uh, individual nodes within ROS, and you have to program uh, cross node communication between uh, different nodes in ROS. So it's very complicated. Uh, it takes years of training uh, to be able to program a simple robot and it takes more time of training to debug a simple robot. But why does it have to be so complicated? If we can have a very good computer architecture abstraction, uh, then if you can program on top of that abstraction and everything becomes very, very simple because at the end of the day, uh, your robot is nothing more than a, a data flow machine. Uh, your job as a programmer is to figure out what kind of data flow you want to implement. Then once you implement the data flow, then let it fly. fly. Uh, that that's all. Uh, so uh, what we are doing is that if we can provide high level language uh, uh, abstraction uh, to leverage the basic operators provided by the architecture, then the programmers does not have to worry about what's underlying that uh, autonomous machine runtime, whether it's GPU, FPGA, or DSP, as long as it provides the same API. Um, then you just have to connect those API uh, to form a machine like that. Uh, if you are interested in programming language, uh, there are a few works of reference. Uh, for you to dig deeper. Um, the last topic, uh, it's technology. If you are an ECS student and you're interested in underlying stuff, a semiconductor uh, stuff, then here's the uh, how, uh, or here's the research area you can work on because autonomous sh machine computing would um, impose many new requirements for computing. For example, better communication, uh, how do you provide better communication? I'm talking about beyond 6G communication between robots because the robots have to talk to each other so that they can share information uh, to understand the environment. Uh, for example, the, the, the MP MGAS uh, technology is the latest one that can uh, enable uh, not just on-chip communication, but uh, cross-chip communication, uh, potentially high-frequency 6G communication. That's one area to work on. And if you're interested in sensing, and you want to work on the latest sensing technology, uh, SPAD, SPAD, uh, that's the latest uh, light sensor that can be implemented for uh, smart cameras or even uh, LiDAR devices. Uh, that's one area to work on to enhance sensing of the, the robots. Um, 3D die stacking, it's been a popular idea for, for the past decade, but no one has applied it to uh, autonomous machine workload yet. But I do think it has a very uh, good potential for autonomous machine workload because it has a very high memory bandwidth when you stack a computing component on top of a memory component. So, uh, but we, the community does not understand what's the impact of the 3D die stacking for Thomson machine computing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, last but not least, nano sheet. Uh, if you can make your chip faster uh, for mission critical kind of robots, uh, for kind of space robot or uh, other military robots or other uh, rescue robots, uh, nano sheet may be uh, next generation of computing platform that can burn less power, uh, but perform higher uh, frequency performance. Um, robot B, that's one application. It's a flying robot that flies at a very high speed, so it has to do computing at a, a faster rate. That's one uh, kind of application in drones as well. Uh, so these are the uh, system and technology connection areas that you can work on if you choose your career. Uh, if you are very, you say if you are not as interested in programming stuff 
or architecture stuff, but you are really interested in a low level technology stuff, here's the uh, the roadmap for you to work on, whether it's um, for robotic computing, uh, for communication, for sensing, there are a lot of things you can work on and a lot of opportunities since we just stepped into the era of autonomous machines. All right, emerging application. This is one project that we have done with uh, the United Nation. Uh, basically, the project said, oh, if you have autonomous vehicle that can drive itself around, if you equip that vehicle with medical equipment, it becomes an autonomous mobile clinic that can provide medical service to uh, rem in remote areas. Uh, the clinic can drive itself to, over there to navigate different locations to provide services. So the basic technology enabling that, uh, including a, a few uh, basic components, autonomous driving or the robotic capability, of course, it's one, but it should not take up uh, more than 20% of the computing power as we have previously discussed. But what's interesting is that you need a computing chip that enable different kind of medical applications in this setup so that uh, you only have to connect to a doctor if necessary, because the sensors on board can do automatic diagnostics of your situation, can take samples of your blood, for example, uh, can do uh, run different kinds of screening tests. We do see the future in these kind of applications as many uh, uh, IEV companies, in, intelligent electric vehicle companies are already starting looking into enabling medical or healthcare usage scenarios in the smart cockpit. So if we flip back to the original story that we discussed, um, that we have a uh, autonomous machine computing ecosystem, this is exactly that. That's the ecosystem, uh, it's a vertical in uh, healthcare. Uh, but the challenge is that how do you combine or, or how do you allocate the computing power available on board so you can leave about 80% of computing power for this application and 20% for the basic stuff. And that's the, the balance we try to strike. Um, with that, um, i like to conclude. And that's the end of uh, today's talk. Uh, um, so we have gone through uh, uh, application and we have gone through the basic architecture and we have gone through programming language. But basically we are in the era of autonomous machine, autonomous machine computing before you know it, but the next two decades would belong to uh, autonomous machine computing instead of mobile computing or personal computing. Uh, now, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them. Thank you, Xiao Shen. Uh, it's the other way I saw that uh, the governor of California took your ride in a uh, in an autonomous uh, driving vehicle today. Are you aware of that? Uh, or, uh, the governor of California. Yep, I, I think he's in China, right? That's right. That's what I mean, yeah. Yep. He was enthused by it. He said, I want two of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. I, I, I just had a, a different question from what you discussed here. Um, I, uh, when you started, you were uh, when you started this work, you were saying that uh, one of the problems with lidar was that it was very expensive, which is probably the reason why uh, uh, Elon Musk said that he were, he didn't want to do to deal with radars. Um, but I think I've read some articles here and there that uh, show that solid state lidars are now available at much lower cost. What's your take on that? Yeah, LiDAR, uh, at the beginning of the, the, uh, the era, LiDAR was an extremely expensive component. Uh, now that they have dropped the price significantly, I think LiDAR, if they're cheap enough, uh, the OEMs are eager to uh, integrate these devices into the system, uh, not as an active sensor, but as a last line of defense so that it makes sure that it doesn't hit something. Mm -hmm. Because Vision, uh, if LiDAR has dropped price significantly, Vision, has advanced even more. Uh, if we roll back three years, we did not have something like core transformer. So again, taking multiple camera data and form a, a BV kind of representation. So vision has uh, advanced tremendously. So most people will use vision as the main sensor, but LiDAR uh, to replace uh, radar as the last line of defense because it's uh -huh. cheap enough now that, that you can use. Yeah, uh, I think, uh... Um, Elon Musk's point to saying, well, we've been driving with our two eyes forever, so we should be able to do it in, uh, in automatic driving systems, which is kind of a dubious uh, uh, scientific uh, decision. Um, 
because like you said, you know, I mean, the more sensors uh, we have, the better off we are. Uh, and if there is, uh, so those uh, LiDAR units that have dropped in price, are they um, solid state or are they, uh, or are they still mechanical? Uh, both, both. Uh, solid state uh, is newer generation. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how mature the technology is, but for mechanical, um, they have figured out how to mass produce these components. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole robotic market uh, rising up. Uh, cleaning robots, for example, service robots, they, they start to adopt uh, LiDAR components. Okay. Uh, so in a way that uh, amortize uh, uh, the the price for uh, uh, for lidar mass production. That's why uh, today you can spend a hundred dollars or less to mm -hmm. get a lidar component for the car. So you can have several actually, one in the front, one in the back, and two on the sides. Correct, correct. And then they're not going to have this ugly protrusion on the roof of the car like in the in the early days of what you of your work. Yep. Definitely. So um, I showed uh, the students uh, the uh, uh, the little T bar that was going uh, above the the little golf cart that you were promoting. Uh, has this changed? What's the what's the new, what's the latest that you have now? Do you, do you still have that little T bar or? Uh, yep. Uh, the reason for the T bar, uh, it's unique to us. It's for the reason that uh, we. Uh, it's a business model thing. We bought uh, golf carts from local suppliers. Then we try to equip the car with sensors. The easier way is to do a T-bar so that uh, you have a two uh, front-facing cameras and two back-facing cameras. But if you do a large-scale production, and that's exactly what Tesla is doing, if you manufacture millions of those cars, you don't have to do a T-bar. You can uh, integrate those sensors within the car, uh, uh, near the rooftop, uh, in front of car, back of car, you can have eight cameras. Uh, but the essential design is the same, uh, so that you can have multiple cameras. Then if you stitch those images together, combine those images together, um, then you have a fairly good perception of the environment, enough to drive the car around. Uh, so logic is basically the same. It's uh, So the T-bar thing is pretty much related to our business model. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what's uh, what's your take on, I think it was a few weeks ago, there was a traffic jam, I think it was in Austin, uh, Texas, where, uh, and it was due to some autonomous taxis. Did, did you hear of that? Yeah, uh, quite a lot of uh, accidents like that. Uh, I don't think we are ready for full autonomy yet. Um, right. uh, I think Waymo crews and some... Chinese companies all hit the same problem. Sometimes it just gets stuck. Uh, I think for perception, maybe it's, uh, we make tremendous progress in perception. But then when the decision engine is still uh, not there yet, mm -hmm. uh, that's why the level two, level three autonomous driving seems to be the most appropriate at, the, at this point for the reason that uh, there's human behind the wheel. If uh, there's a, a deadlock situation, the human mm -hmm. can still handle that kind of situation, but a machine cannot. Um, so I don't think level four time driving will be ready within the next three to five years. We'll mm -hmm. still see a tremendous amount of uh, uh, level two, level three time driving in, in uh, commercially available vehicles uh, uh, of the uh, shelf vehicles uh, today. And uh, in the next five years, we will see tremendous growth, but not a fully autonomous vehicle. Yeah, here on the UCI campus, they deliver... Uh, they, they have these little things that are about yay big uh, with six wheels that are, they use to deliver pizza. Uh, they, they go all, all, over, all across the campus. Sometimes they get stuck. Uh, and, but the, 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 the funniest thing is if they get stuck like in a ditch, people will come up to it and say, oh, little guy, oh, you, should, you got stuck, let me help you. <laughs> So they start talking to it like it was a like it was a person, and they have this uh, uh, emotional reaction to it. And definitely, it's, definitely. It's just three laptops stuck together, you know. <laughs> well, uh, Shaoshan, thank you so much for uh, for your talk. Thank yeah. you. And uh, I'm sure you'll get some questions offline, and now uh, people, uh, you if. Uh, the uh, Shashan's slides are going to be online, and uh, if you need to contact him, 
I think your your email was on it. If not, just send it, send me and I'll, for, I'll forward your message. Okay. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you to our two guest speakers. I think Tong Mio just uh, logged out. Thank you. And uh, this is it for today. So I'll just stop the, the recording. Thank you.